Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, the 33rd and final event for the 6th Unbound Book Festival. My name is Alex George, and I am the founder and director of the festival. It is April 23rd, Shakespeare's birthday, appropriately enough, and this was supposed to be the day that we were to gather in the Missouri Theatre in Columbia, Missouri, to listen to this evening's guests in person. And wonderful though it would have been to be able to do so, if this year's online festival has taught me anything, it's that virtual events, while not being the same as being face-to-face, -face, can still be inspiring and uplifting for all involved. And I know that the next hour and a half will prove that theory beyond any shade of doubt. Usually the keynote takes place at the start of the festival and we get to look forward to all that is to come. Today, of course, the opposite applies, and instead I have the opportunity to reflect on what the festival has already brought us. This year's writers and poets have been quite extraordinary. They have entertained us and inspired us, they've made us think, and they have moved us. It has been a wonderful three months, and I'm so grateful to every one of the 69 authors who have joined us this year for sharing their time with us. Being online allowed us to welcome writers not just from all across the United States, but also from Canada, the UK, and even as far as Vietnam. And being online has also made it possible to watch from anywhere in the world. Astonishingly, more than 35,000 people have tuned in to watch an Unbound event this year. And if there are any events that you've missed, it's possible to re-watch them at your leisure by going to the website, unboundbookfestival.com, clicking on the event that you want and following the links from there. Speaking of the website, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you that we now have a store uh, on the website for all of your Unbound merch. So please do go there, uh, visit, and we've got some, some fun things that you can get and uh, represent the festival all year long. The Authors in the Schools program also wrapped up its three-month run yesterday with an amazing event with the novelist and poet Erica Sanchez. The program continues to grow every year, and at least 10,000 students from kindergarten through 12th grade heard an author speak this year. And we couldn't have done that without the support from Columbia Public Schools, the Daniel Boone Regional Library, and the Assistance League of Mid-Missouri. And of course, all of the educators who allowed us into their classrooms, virtual or otherwise. When we gather in person, the amazing team of Unbound volunteers is always easy to spot. They're the ones handing out the programs, herding authors hither and yon, and answering questions. This year, they are hiding behind the scenes, but their contribution has still been enormous. Putting on Unbound has always been challenging and complicated. Putting it online is just challenging and complicated in a different way. From our outreach team, to our board, to our programming committee, everyone has embraced our new reality with enthusiasm. Our volunteers all give so generously of their time, and I'm so, so grateful to every one of them. Unbound really is a labor of love, and it wouldn't be the festival it is without them. Particular thanks are due to our incredibly hardworking tech team, without whom, quite literally, none of this would have happened. They have run these online events with skill and dedication, and when things go haywire, which they occasionally have done, they seem to have nothing but ice in their veins. So Laura, Lauren, Hallam and Ruel, I salute you and thank you so much. The festival, as you probably know, is free to attend. And without revenue from ticket sales, we couldn't put the event on without the incredible support that we have received year in, year out from members of our community and beyond. And my deepest thanks to absolutely everyone who has donated to Unbound since we began this adventure. We've also been fortunate to receive generous assistance from the City of Columbia, specifically the Office of Cultural Affairs and the Convention and Visitors Bureau. KBIA and Como Magazine are our media sponsors, and I'd also like to thank all of the local businesses who have sponsored this year's events. A complete list of our partners and supporters is on the website. And even though we haven't been there since 2019, Stevens College remains our home. We miss the beautiful campus there and look forward to returning in April of 2022. 
This evening's event is sponsored by the Creative Writing Program in the Department of English at the University of Missouri. We're thrilled to welcome them as the sponsor of this event and very grateful to them for their support. Our guests will be in conversation until about eight o'clock or so, and then they'll be taking questions from the audience. If you have a question for them, please write it in the comment box. And although we won't get to them until eight o'clock, it's quite helpful if you post your questions early so our directors can sort through them ahead of time. As usual, we're giving away copies of both of our guests' most recent box to a randomly selected questioner. Well, in fact, as this is our uh, season finale, as it were, we're going to go bananas and actually select two winners this evening. So submit your questions for a chance to win. Tonight's guests are two of the most celebrated and beloved poets in America. Jericho Brown is the recipient of a Whiting Writers Award and fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, and the National Endowment for the Arts. His first book, Please, won the American Book Award. His second, The New Testament, won the Annisfield Wolf Book Award and was named one of the books of the year by Library Journal, Cold Front, and the Academy of American Poets. His most recent collection, The Tradition, won the Pulitzer Prize. His poems have appeared in The Nation, The New York Times, The New Yorker, The New Republic, Time, the Pushcart Prize Anthology, and several volumes of the best American poetry anthologies. He is an associate professor and director of the Creative Writing Program at Emory University in Georgia. And this is actually Jericho's second appearance at Unbound this year, having already spoken on our poetry and prayer panel in February. We're thrilled to welcome him back. This evening, Jericho will be in conversation with Tracy K. Smith. Tracy is the author of the critically acclaimed memoir, Ordinary Light, and four spellbinding volumes of poetry. Her first collection, The Body's Question, was the winner of the 2002 Carve Khan and Poetry Prize. Duende won the 2006 James Laughlin Award from the Academy of American Poets and an Essence Literary Award. Her third book, Life on Mars, won the 2012 Pulitzer Prize. Her most recent collection of poems, Wade in the Water, was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize and was selected as a New York Times notable book. She is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Academy Fellowship from the Academy of American Poets, which is awarded to one poet each year to recognize distinguished poetic achievement. In 2017, she was appointed the 22nd United States Poet Laureate. After her undergraduate work at Harvard, Tracy earned her MFA at Columbia before going on to be a Stegner Fellow in Poetry at Stanford University. She is the Roger S. Berlin 52 Professor in the Humanities and the Director of the Creative Writing Program at Princeton University. It is my enormous pleasure to welcome both Jericho Brown and Tracy K. Smith to Unbound. Hello, thank you so much. Hi. Hi, Jericho. Hey, hi, Tracy. All right, I'm gonna take off and uh, I'll leave you two to it. Okay, thanks, Alex. Tracy, you're gonna read for us some, right? I will, yeah, I'll start out. Um, and I'll just preface these poems by saying these are our new poems. And I think this work has been a way of trying to stay, I don't know what the adjective is, sane, hopeful, um, alive, during this this year of so much um, loss, so much revelation, you know, much of which was very painful. Um, and I feel that these are poems that are speaking outward and backward to ancestors and to peers. So I'm talking to you in these poems, Jericho, um, and I'll be excited to talk with you after I share them. So um, I'll start with a, a sequence, a short sequence called Riot. Sometimes I feel the black in my heart like a map made of tar. You need only part your lips to mar what isn't yours. Think better. Don't bother. Your druthers clog my sieve is the matter. We pay to live. Our nerves carry a charge. We grieve each day. We pray 
for you. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, how thick is memory, how deep the grave. Thick is memory, deep the grave. How many are we? Many are we. What have we been led here to learn, to teach? We have been led here to learn, to teach. Is life within our grasp? Life within is in our grasp. Have we ever felt death so near as we do this year? Have we ever near, dear, year upon year? The ancestors live upstairs in a room without chairs. When I visit, they welcome me without words. They crouch, encircling me. They are without edges. Wordless, they fill me. Warmth without weight. I ask for something. Without shame, I beg. They owe me nothing but they give, they give. Can you hold my death in your mind? Can you leave it there, live and let grieve? I like you, and like you, I move through the days. A dark shape is what my body makes. Good is how I was taught to look, to be, Despite what's done to me, woe is me. To say is to do is also true. Woe is you. This is not the riot. This is reality. It rolls, roils, briefly recoils. It hammers down. We fall, rebound. You chase. We race, you hate, we wait. That feeling of call and response that lives in that poem and to me that drives that poem or enables that poem um, is very true to um, different mode that um, has kind of driven my my writing over this past year. Um, I really do feel that poems help us to see and, and hear ourselves better, to engage with the outside world. And I've always said about my own writing that I'm listening to myself, I'm listening beyond myself, ideally, to something that is there. But this year, I feel that the something that is there is is loud, is present, has agency, is not a metaphor. And so a lot of the work that I've been writing feels um, in some ways like it emerges from meditation and like it uh, marks a kind of engagement with um, maybe a large sense of memory. Um, and some of the poems, well, I'll read one now that is, um, I guess, tapping into a, um, a memory that is not mine, that I don't claim, um, but that I think belongs to all of us as Americans. I'll read the epigraph to kind of frame it. Helen Plain, a Civil War widow and charter member of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, spearheaded the first attempt to carve the Stone Mountain Memorial. She was a Klan sympathizer. And after Gutson Borglum, a Klan sympathizer, was chosen as the monument sculptor in 1915, Plain wrote him a letter with a design suggestion. She said, quote, why not represent a small group of them in their nightly uniform approaching in the distance? So this poem is kind of a, a willed engagement with the imaginative space that, that could have thought of such a, such a proposition and it's called A Suggestion. Why not represent a small group of them in their nightly uniform, approaching in the distance? Why not represent a small group of us 
in our nightly uniform, approaching in the distance. Why not a small group of us in our uniform, approaching? Why not us approaching, wearing what we bear? Carve us there. Let the silence of threat embolden our approach. Let any who stand to fear the white tide of our rising, let them hide as we are forced to hide. Let them scurry under cover. Let them cower. Let them wait for the end that awaits them. Shame, bruise, blood, snub, the whip, the rope and tree, police, policy, courtesy to the face, and then when again it is just us alone at the hearth of power, let us stoop, let us bend, let us buckle in half to tend the countless gears of their comeuppance, though it be generations hence, lest they forget. Why not represent a small group of us in our nightly uniform approaching in the distance? Um, when I think about this impulse to lean backward toward what I want to think of as an ancestral imagination um, and also lean toward a, a, a historical imagination, maybe a, a sense of the American perspective um, on belonging and on power, um, what I imagine myself to be doing is trying to come to terms with the American imagination. And I think this year, if we needed a uh, reminding, um, urged us to understand that our, our imagination is, um, is brittle, it is um, stuck, and that we, um, if we're going to survive as a culture, are going to have to find ways of um, reviving it, expanding it, and eradicating so many of our you know, fears, biases, um, and and phobias from that. Um, and so I think that's what these poems are hoping to do, to be helpful in that effort. Um, maybe I'll read one more poem, and this is also um, documentary in nature. I teach um, at Princeton, and this summer, the university finally decided that it was time to remove Woodrow Wilson's name from the, univers the University School of Public and International Affairs and from a residential college. And I was grateful for that. Um, I was also very mindful of the fact that black students had been asking um, or urging the university to do this for more than five years. Um, and I wanted to mark that moment of victory uh, for them, for us. Um, and so this is a poem that uses found language from an essay that Woodrow Wilson wrote in celebration of Robert E. Lee. And it's a poem that's um, thinking about the moment that we finally um, allowed ourselves to, to see for what it is. It's called Found Poem. It is not necessary to recount his achievements, those things done, not done in order to serve a simple end. I think it says something that it should have taken so short a time for the whole nation to see the true measure of this man's life. If you love a country that does not, does not, was conceived not to want you, I want to remind you we live, we live. Turn your faces and your hands likewise to the task of life. Deep color, ardor of blood. Okay, thanks so much for listening. Deep color, ardor of blood, indeed. Thank you so much for that reading. Um, I'm not ready because I was a little teary. It's really wonderful <laughs> to hear you read new poems, Tracy. And you know, uh, and I'm sure there are many people watching who feel this way. I've been reading your books since your first book, uh, Memoir, the Books of Poetry. And so it's so interesting to watch transformation take place in the poems. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk about 
that transformation as, as well. Um, how do you see the sh the concern, your concern shifting mm -hmm. from a book like The Body's Question, the first book I read that made me fall in love with you? It's the first book and the only book I've ever read by a poet. You know this. I read The Body's Question. This is Tracy K. Smith's first book. I read The Body's Question and I closed it and I said, I need to be friends with her. <laughs> <laughs> be my friend. <laughs> so um, I would like for you to talk about what you think of as those those transformations. And in particular, this book is very different uh, from a book, uh, the book you're working on, these new poems seems to me very different from, um, from a book like Duende, because Duende was so definitely insisting on a we, mm -hmm. no matter what, over and over again. But this book, these poems still seem to have a we but they also have a you, yeah. Uh, which I thought was really, I, was just blown. I have to say, I was like, whoa, who is you? Do you know what I mean? Um, there's also really strong, uh, you know, it's like the thing we tell our students not to do and then we try to go figure out how to do it. Strong use of to be verbs, this sort of stasis that we've been in <laughs> for the last year being reflected uh, in these poems. Can you talk about um, how surprised are you by the fact of these poems. Mm -hmm. um, when you were writing the books in the past, could you have imagined mm -hmm. writing a book like the one you're clearly working on now? Oh gosh. Well, I feel that um, these poems remind me of what I wasn't aware of when I first started writing, which was that I was on a journey, not just to mark my place in you know my, the world, not just to um, understand how the the allegiances I have you know reverberate outward, which is what I think in some ways the body's question was about, mm -hmm. claiming an I, claiming a me, and then feeling the warmth and comfort and um, courage of other bodies that could help embolden that even further. Mm -hmm. um, Duende, I felt like is a book about saying, oh, but I belong to a nation. Ooh, and it's it's problematic. What does that urge me to recognize? What does this we need to um, remind itself of? Um, but these poems are, if if life on Mars was about thinking about humanity from you know a distance, like you know, the future or space, and maybe Wade in the Water was about, okay, let's get back to Earth and think about history. I feel like these poems are like in the street, on the ground, you know, like underfoot, um, which is a way of saying, this is the position I think that black people in this country are being made aware of if we weren't already, that, that we occupy and that there's power there. You know, there's the opportunity to spring forth in some magnificent and necessary way. These are poems that I think are helping me to think about what that might mean for me. And so they're thinking about a we that is black. They're thinking about a we that is, like I was saying, uh, ancestral. Because um, mm -hmm. I feel like I've been talking to the ancestors in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and they're thinking about a you that is America, that is white, that is fearful, that is silent, that is resistant, that is um, intoxicated by a kind of power that has caused great damage. Um, you know, I love, I love um, Lucille Clifton so much. And I think about, you know, many of her poems, but one, whose side are you on? These are poems about choosing sides. Mm -hmm. And these are poems about saying, I'm going to talk to us, but you need to hear what I want to say to us. Um, and that feels very different, you know, but this is a, this is a different year. <laughs> You know, you would mention a writer like Lucy Clifton, who is also very serious about who the ancestors were and what they were capable of in the present moment. Um, you know, those poems that she said were dictated to her, right? Mm -hmm. The ones, as she would say. Uh, and even when you were speaking, you said you didn't you no longer think of the met the ancestors as just metaphorical. Mm -hmm. Feel in any way guided 
as you are writing these poems. And is that scary for you? Or <laughs> is that welcome? Uh, are these poems more difficult um, or easier for you to write? Uh, particularly considering the fact of the pandemic. What is writing like mm -hmm. now? Is it the same as it has always been or is it different? Oh gosh, I'm so glad you asked that question. I, you know, when we entered this pandemic and thought it was going to be a few months um, and child, you know, living with children all around seemed like um, the burden <laughs> that I was going to be dealing with. I just felt my imagination in so many different places I couldn't focus. And then it became clear that we are living through a moment of racial reckoning um, and the deep and abiding injustice that we've long um, been made to, to tolerate has become so plain and bold and in so many different contexts, unapologetic. Um, and the terms changed. Um, it's not that I said, I'm gonna sit down and write poems that are gonna speak back to this, but I felt so betrayed, um, not by America, because, you know, this is part of a, a recognizable pattern, you know. Mm -hmm. um, George Floyd's death is part of a pattern that has not yet ceased, mm -hmm. um, and we know that. But to, to witness um, versions of that pattern in spaces that I have long thought to be safe, um, was a, a shock to me and very painful um, to feel, um, you know, attacked because I want to talk about racial justice in rooms where I've had dinner with people many times. That um, that really changed uh, my sense of the safety, you know. And so these poems come out of tremendous despair. And one of the things that I turned to was a meditation practice. And I've always thought poetry was meditative. Like I said, I'm going inward, I'm going outward, but ask <laughs> and be ready, you know, to say who is there, who, who can I talk to? And then just to, to say, oh, okay, you're here. You're here and you're gonna talk to me. You're gonna show me some things. That's amazing and fearsome and um, life-saving. And so these are poems that are coming out of that. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know how to not sound, you know, wild-eyed in saying that, but I don't even really want to make it seem like it's about art. It's oh. about something to me now that feels bigger than that. And I think many of us are, are are working in our own vocabularies towards something that's larger than art. Um, ritual seems essential to the, the step forward that we might take because logic doesn't work. And so these are poems that are kind of just coming up out of all of these different sources and, and, and realizations and, and a new willingness, I think, to engage in a different way with, with um, reality and with the past. It's really, it is really strange, uh, particularly when you are a black writer to have, to talk about the places where poetry and spirituality intersect, mm -hmm. um, especially if you, after you, I mean, maybe it's different in, in MFA and PhD programs now, but you know, you're not supposed to talk about those things at mm -hmm. all. And yet I notice in the background, you have um, Sonia Sanchez is collected. And so mm -hmm. the intersection of, of blackness and spirituality is always coming through historically yeah. uh, in our in our poems. I want to be. I want to just bag up. There are two things that you mentioned, and I wanted to get back to them. But one of them just had to do with. It seems to me that these poems, part of what you're saying, is that they are literal acts of resistance. You know, um, given what was going on in the world, you too wanted to be able to have conversations about what was going on mm -hmm. with your own personal circle. And those conversations were not allowed. And so mm -hmm. you needed to speak. Um, what's, what's interesting to me about that is, and you can, um, you can confirm this for me, or you can maybe talk about this if you have something to say about it. That, I mean, that would mean that you were trying to have conversations with people who it would seem to me know these things already, or we have this idea that they should know these things. If you thought you were safe 
in those environments, then you were trying to have those conversations with people, not with the clan. <laughs> it's not like you were talking to what's her name? Is her yeah, name? Helen Plain. Yeah, Helen, Helen Plain. It's not like it's not like you were having this conversation with Helen Plain, and Helen Plain was being herself. You know what I mean? Yeah. You were having this conversation in a in an unexpected way with people who maybe you expected to know better. Or mm -hmm. It's just interesting because we, you know, the, the new vocabulary of systemic racism invites you to think about what are the systems, right? And so you say, well, here's one. <laughs> here's, here are some others. Oh, look, here's one right in the room with us. Yeah. What can we do about that? And that's the space where the liberal values, and this is something, you know, Claudia Rankin's work has made us aware of this so powerfully um, for me, but that's the space where the cognition of you know justice of of um liberal values kind of wobbles because you're saying to someone but you have all this power do you think you could be more responsible with it what if we take a little bit of that away and give it to some of these people over here and those are fighting words you know and even in the, the most, you know, um, you know, those are fighting words. I think you could say it though, even in the most wood, I didn't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let's just say the most polite spaces. Um, it, it change, okay. um, change is uh, threatening. Okay, well, going from ancestors and speaking of change, you mentioned earlier that uh, one of your fears at the beginning of the pandemic, people might not know this, but you have not one, not two, but three kids, two of them, <laughs> two, and you know, I always make fun of you. I say, how are you with your nine kids? Oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but you have three kids, two, uh, you have twin, a set of twins. Um, can you talk about what writing has been like as a mother? Um, uh, and not just a mother, a mother three times over. Uh, and can you talk about how you balance uh, your need to get your work done as well as your, your need to be good at being a mother? Mm -hmm. Well, usually, you know, my kids go off to school and I have some time if, you know, I'm on sabbatical or I'm not teaching. There's this silence that I can count on to go inward and to sort of create a sense of balance. Um, to ask the questions that that I need to ask. And um, that disappeared when the schools closed. And um, the need for sort of support got even more, you know, intense. Um, what I found myself doing was saying all of the, all the needs that I used to have a, about wanting to make it look like I was on top of everything, <laughs> wanting my kids to, you know, I, I remember my mom, you know, my parents' generation um, born in the 30s, you know, you couldn't embarrass your parents going out. You had to do right, look right, act right, or they would give you those looks and suddenly you would snap to it. My kids don't respond to those looks. Um, and I finally just gave up and said, let's just be us and let them be them. I'm going to go outside and sit under these trees for uh, an hour and try and stay sane. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what's been so exciting is that, you know, it's not just about struggle. It's about clearing up the space to say, okay, whoever's talking to me is affirming that I'm not crazy, that this is part of what the world has looked like and that I'm contributing to something that will be a long time in coming, but it's, it's a real thing. And so I can go inside and laugh now. <laughs> I can go inside and watch Blackish with my children and, you know, just laugh at America. Mm -hmm. And those things have, have been really helpful. <laughs> my life feels so different, but um, in some ways it feels better. After, I want to, um, you talked, we're sort of just talking about changes, obviously, uh, since we're in the middle of, of such upheaval and, and change. Um, so, I, I, and I asked you some questions about the difference between writing now and writing earlier in your career and uh, what writing is like now that you have kids and and what writing is like, like as your own sense of um, ancestral dedication transforms and expands and changes. But uh, you were introduced to us as a beloved poet before this, uh, 
before your reading began. And I think that is true. And you're, you are, uh, for me, I mean, you really are one of my favorite contemporary American poets. Uh, but you're also a pretty well lauded poet. Poet. So maybe this question really is just for me and not for everybody else. Can you talk about how you're able to continue to do what you do after certain kinds of recognition? Is it more difficult to write after becoming the poet laureate of the United States of America? Hmm. Is it more difficult or easier to write after winning the Pulitzer Prize? Um, can you talk about what your reaction is when these wonderful things like this happen to you? And, and you know, there's the reaction you have, but what does that, what has that meant for you as a writer? Do you feel at all that your writing is also changed by not just what you're seeing on the news or the way we're treated as black people, but also does, does your writing change because of recognition, mm -hmm. um, because of acknowledgement, because of prizes? Does that have any effect on what you're able to produce or, or, or how you censor yourself or how you say more than what you would say mm -hmm. before? I wanna hear you answer this question too. <laughs> I'll say that um, naive, you know, I'm a youngest child mm -hmm. and I feel like the way I've chosen to look at things like prizes is, um, a form of affirmation that tells me, okay, just keep doing this thing uh, and believing that it's okay for you to do it and maybe you're even supposed to be doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've tried to tell myself, take a minute to enjoy the affirmation, but also just keep doing the thing in, in, in a way that feels necessary. Um, but I'll tell you, the Pulitzer Prize kind of it, that changed a little bit for me. Um, I had a lot of anxiety about um, following that book, following Life on Mars up. Um, I was writing prose for many years and that felt like a kind of relief, like, okay, let me lose myself. Let me start all over and learn something and, and tap into some material that that other book that Life on Mars kind of alerted me to. Namely for me, it was really about God. Um, that I, I knew I had a vocabulary for and I needed to write that book to figure out what it was. Um, but I had some anxiety about writing poems again because um, I was afraid that, well, you know, I have to write a different book and maybe it's not gonna be as, you know, as good or something like that. And then Trump got elected we enter, you know, and poetry did the marvelous thing that it always does. It says, girl, forget about all that stuff. You have a problem and I'm here to help you. And so thinking about America, thinking about history, thinking about, you know, the fears, the um, just what, what we were witnessing and um, moving through and hopefully uh, intervening within during that, that period, that's where um, Wait in the Water, that's how it started. Mm -hmm. um, and I forgot all about, you know, prizes. Yeah. And I guess poetry, um, when it can help you forget about all that stuff, then you know you're really writing it, right? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. What about you? Um, well, it's exhilarating, you know, because it's not something you can expect. You know, I didn't have a plan. I mean, I never, <laughs> certainly, I certainly didn't think a book with a poem called Good White People. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I didn't have it, uh, you know, I um, I try to be who I am whole. And I've always thought if I, if I am who I am whole and if I am who I am all the time, then that will be the reward. But that I won't get other rewards <laughs> because of that. Um, and you know, so it was a, a surprise to me, a, a very happy surprise. Uh, and I was really, I mean, what I really thought about at that moment was how I had the opportunity to be among this list of names of people who I really just cherish, love, and admire, and how, um, you know, you know, the first the first black man to win the Pulitzer Prize from the Pulitzer Prize for poetry is from Louisiana. So I was thinking, <laughs> you know, I was thinking about Yusuf Komunyaka mm -hmm. and how, you know, I get to, you know, stand with him in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, as a black man from Louisiana, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that was part of it. And I think um, 
I think like you, I've sort of, as you were saying, I had a lot of anxiety. I still do. I'm sort of giving the anxiety a year, you know, um, mm -hmm. I feel like in early May, by the time early May comes around again, that's when the Pulitzer was announced last year. By the time May 5th or 6th, whenever it was announced, I'm gonna like get myself together no matter what, you know? So there, there's a lot, I feel like I'm um, promenading for a year, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I just show up on Zoom. <laughs> like my yeah. job is to show up on Zoom. Um, but what I have loved about this year, though it's a, a a bittersweet kind of a love, but it is love. I love seeing how much people had this intuitive understanding that they needed poetry. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the way in which we have been, when I say we, I'm not just talking about you and me, I'm talking about poets. Mm -hmm. We have never been called upon in the way that we have been called upon in this last year, I think, or mm -hmm. in my lifetime at least. Mm -hmm. um, not, not when I was paying attention, you know. Uh, and I think uh, the ways in which we have been called upon it, it really proves that we we, we create these gifts for the world, you know, um, that the world doesn't even know it needs, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to get back to asking you questions because I'll just start talking like we're on the phone, and I'll forget people are watching, and that's not good. 2014, an op-ed in uh, the New York Times that you wrote. I think it's called Wipe That Smirk Off Your Face. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about irony and the pitfalls of irony. Um, have your ideas about that changed at all? Um, or are they even more firm in, mm -hmm. the, in the midst of a time like now? And maybe you could talk a little bit about what you were thinking about, particularly in 2014, when you, when mm -hmm. you wrote that op-ed. Yeah, I mean, I think I was thinking about, um, the way that a certain goal uh, for smart people can be to demonstrate intelligence and detachment. And sometimes poems are really good at doing that and you feel like you're in the know. Um, and that essay was kind of advocating for a form of sincerity and vulnerability, even to maybe not looking in control, mm -hmm. um, because that felt to me, well, at the time it felt to me like a generous way of um, opening up space for yourself and the poem and the reader to do some really interesting kind of human work together. That's not about performance. Mm -hmm. um, that's not about, um, you know, that's not about um, power. But what I feel now is it's it's urgent not because those po those kinds of poems are helpful in private terms. Um, the poems that that say, okay, we're gonna get past um, the the what I'm certain of and what I'm confident of and what I can control to this other place. Um, because we, we need this as a culture. You know, I, I keep saying this because I'm really trying to figure out what a vocabulary for a major shift in our collective imagination could look like. And I'm not saying vocabulary because I think it needs to live in language. I think that it needs to live in the body and in um, what precedes language, that thing that lives in poems that are not all about um, demonstrating something that the poet is aware of. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that what precedes understanding, what um, is more emphatic than um, the knowledge and what can make us willing to say, no matter who we are, that we're broken and we need to change. So all year I've been saying, okay, white America is broken. Uh, capitalist America is broken. We need to help white America and capitalist America, you know, understand that they're broken. And um, now I feel that that awareness 
is about wanting to invite these others, these other groups to say, um, let's heal um, together. I don't think that came out very well, but the very people that have made me feel so vulnerable and angry <laughs> this year, um, I want to write poems that can help them want to do a different kind of work together with me. Mm -hmm. um, I want to write poems that can create the space that those conversations that we've been having over Zoom <laughs> haven't managed to do. Mm -hmm. um, and to have them say, oh, it's not about keeping my job. It's not about making concessions so there's not a, an uprising in the street, but it's about figuring out how to be whole, you know, mm -hmm. um, together and together. Um, in 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 individual terms, mm -hmm. so the poems and the art and the conversation and whatever other kinds of engagement we could muster that bring us out of you know out of those old modes. Um, I'm really I'm really kind of eager to um, to help create, help facilitate. Um, I called it irony, but I don't know what I would call it now. I think it it I think it has to do with the complacency of believing that you belong in or toward the top of of these hierarchies. You know, are they literary hierarchies? Are they professional hierarchies? Are they are they economic? Are they about real estate? You know, yeah. yeah. It's a um it's very, very dangerous. It seems to me there's a little bit of an echo. I hope it's not in trouble. But uh, it's very dangerous to sort of uh, risk what you're saying. Uh, and I remember much of the criticism of Claudia Rankin Citizen, which you mentioned earlier, had to do with people thinking that Claudia, a black woman, had written these poems for white people or to help white people. So how? <laughs> this, is, this is like the worst thing anybody could ever do, you know, like, which is really um, uh, as if it were the worst thing anyone could do, mm -hmm. which is really an interesting um, sort of uh, viewpoint, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a viewpoint that would suggest that there will always be a us and a, a, mm -hmm. a we and a you, as your poems have, late, have lately been saying. Um, so I just want to ask you uh, before, um, maybe maybe this this might be the last question, but maybe we have a couple, maybe I'll have time for a couple more, more one more. I wanted to ask you about fear and how you handle fear, mm -hmm. uh, or how you're able to take risks, or how not just in your poems but also in your life as a poet. You know, um, what kinds of risks? are you interested in taking? What kinds of risks have you taken? And how do you get over the fear necessary to walk in that land of danger when you are walking? Uh, is it the trees that you're mm -hmm. going to sit under? Uh, are those trees new for you? If so, how was it before? Are the trees helping better than what helped before? Mm -hmm. There's a lot. Um, part of what, you know, part of that feeling of like, why is she doing this to help them? I, it comes from the sense that we're always helping them. We, 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 that's all we've been doing and yet they don't want help. Um, and I get it, but I also believe we actually have the answer. Like we are right. Yeah. And so we can't sit on that. Yeah. And that is something that's been emboldening to me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I, as an individual, am right. But there are times when I recognize that I belong to something that is right and that does know. And that, you know, here I go back into this sort of weird space, but that can speak through me sometimes. And that's when the fear disappears, you know? when I feel like maybe I'm in service of this big good thing that I care about. Um, and I think that's probably, there's a version of that that has empowered so many acts of, um, of resistance um, and, and creation 
over this last year, but it's really been more than a year, right? It's it's been um, it's been generations. Um, I like that time is fast and slow at the same time. So you you take this step forward and you feel this lump in your throat and you 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 think you have something to contribute and so you just do it because that's what the moment calls for. And then there's this other, the slow time where you feel like everybody's mad at you because you did something that they don't agree with. But then we move forward. And how grateful are we that Citizen is in our mm -hmm. in our deep memory now mm -hmm. because it articulates what what we see and and it becomes a part of our shared vocabulary for diagnosing what we need to try and accept and acknowledge, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I feel that um, the tradition is, it is you, your voice, your mode, but it is also bigger than you. And you are thinking, um, I mean, I've talked to you before about pronouns in that book and how you create a large spacious sense of blackness as eternal, as multi, you know, a multiplicity as a unified thing, um, as a form of logic. So how do you answer the question that you just asked me? Uh, I'll just say that when I, well, first I'll say that book got done, got finished and is the book that it is because of the art that I was experiencing up to the moment of, fi of finishing that book. I mean, it's a book that could not have been written if Citizen hadn't come out before it. It's a book that could not have been written if um, if I wasn't watching Barry Jenkins's Moonlight 500 times in a row. You know what I mean? I think I spent I think I spent literal hundreds of dollars to go into the theater. There was no way to see Moonlight. And I just had to have it. Every time I would see it, I would take a different person, and so I became like the usher. <laughs> Barry <laughs> Jenkins's Moonlight. Um, so I think um, I think that's the first thing. So one of the ways that I get over that fear is I pay attention to what and who I love. This is what I tell my students. I wanted to ask you about teaching too. This is what I tell my students. My students have fear because you know, they're 20. You know, and that's what you have when you're 20. <laughs> you have a good time and you have fear. Um, and for me, what I have to do what my job, part of my job is to show them what they love when they read poems. They're in my workshop. Mm -hmm. They fall in love with these poems while they're in my workshop and they've fallen in love with poems before they've been in my workshop. And I say to them, what you're reading is the result of someone who is willing to lose their mind. <laughs> Do you, know mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And they realize that they see these bold moves being made in poetry. Um, they see people uh, literally losing their minds or becoming vulnerable. They can see the investigation and the discovery through language going on in the poem. And when they see that, when I see that, it, I say to myself, well, I'm not gonna have what that poet had. I'm not gonna be able to make what that poet was able to make unless I'm willing to take the leap. You know, you talk a lot about taking the leap. You know? mm -hmm. um, and so so for me, uh, when I read Gwendolyn Brooks, I think this is someone who was really willing <laughs> over and over again and for a long time. Yes. You know, um, from from gay chaps at the bar to the Kura flower, you know, to lose her mind, you know, that Beverly Hills poems, that, that long line sonnet way of making like just amazing work over and over again. And so I think about the people I love and I think, well, that's somebody who was willing to have the discipline and the vulnerability and the intimacy necessary to get work done. And so that's what I've been, um, I think that's how I, I'm able to get over it. Um, I also think that I have some of the best friends in the whole world. Uh, I appreciate you. And uh, I, I, I'm glad people let me complain in the meantime. So I think we have some questions coming in from the audience. My doorbell is ringing. Hopefully somebody will come in. You're going to answer the door? <laughs> I'm not going to answer the door. I'm just going to pray. 
that nothing's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> My doors ring because the front yard's on fire. Um, I should I should begin to um, to ask you something. Thank you so much, Tracy. Oh, thank you, Jericho. Uh, um, a question for Tracy from Sadie. Hi, Sadie. When your small from when your small form tumbled into me is my favorite poem of all time. What sparked the inspiration to write from such a unique perspective? What value do you find in writing from a perspective that is not your own? Um, you have to remember the poem. Yeah, I have to remember the poem. Thank you for um, for liking that poem. Um, I, you know, that book, Life on Mars, was written during, you know, I, I allowed myself to think and be stunned by the many miracles that we live with. Death is one of them um, and birth is one of them. And during that time I was writing the book, I was grieving the death of my father and I was anticipating the birth of my first child, my daughter. And so um, I was thinking about trying to kind of think about those two spaces at the same time. What is this little soul doing and um, before she decides to be my daughter. Wow. Um, and so it was a little thought experiment. Um, and writing a poem, you know, that poem is, I guess it comes from my imagination, but I try and sometimes throw my, my mind's eye out into places where I can look around and see new terms, new, you know, if it's terrain, that I, I'm, I'm imagining that spatial reality helps me to think about um, how to ask the questions or, or make the suppositions that, that might be very abstract in my head otherwise. Um, and, and that helps me feel like I can keep living with the questions that I have if I can just ask them from different um, positions and maybe learn a little bit more um, about about myself, but also about what I believe we belong to in, in like cosmic terms. Uh, we have a question from Tim. Uh, Tim says, in our group, we experimented with two poetic techniques. Tim's got a group, I'm jealous. Yeah. Tracy, we worked with erasure poetry. From Jericho, we worked with the duplex. Go in with the duplex form. How did these innovations find their way into your I'll just start um, by saying that I made the duplex. I don't know why I was thinking about it. Um, Nikki Finney has, as I think, an epigraph in one of her books, a quote from A.J. Verdale, or maybe it's an acknowledge, part of the acknowledgement section, but A.J. Verdale obviously at some point said to, um, to Nikki Finney, repetition is holy. And I wanted to make a poem that proved it. I wanted to make a poem that was spell casting or that sounded like chanting. And uh, I was wondering how many times can you say something? Do you know what I mean? What does return sound like? And why does, why does that make us feel um, more, um, whether it's sadness or love or happiness? Why does something about repetition and poetry make us feel more? Mm -hmm. and, so, um, and so I think that's one of the ways that it found it's way into my work and I was thinking about it for a very long time. I was sort of designing the duplex in my head before I knew to call it the duplex for a very long time before I sat down to, to write one. Uh, what about you, Tracy? Well, I love that you say, you know, holy and, and that that's an urge that you wanted to draw into your work because I feel, you know, I I feel like the, whole, the holy is um, endlessly uh, alluring to me. And I think, you know, my sense of faith means that it is, you know, godly or or something with whatever that spirit is. But my sense of the world is also that I'm trying to get to a place that is awake and that's innocent. And that to me feels holy. And um, even, you know, the erasure poem, which I had never thought was going to be part of my work as a writer all the years that I was in school reading erasure poems and thinking about documentary poetry that seemed like something other people did. Um, I was looking at history with such a sense of need and fear um, that I was maybe looking for a living voice or 
some version of the holy in these sources, you know, and so I'm listening for something holy that can speak even through Woodrow Wilson, right? To, that can tell the truth that he he didn't believe. Um, or the Declaration of Independence. Do we really believe all of these founding documents are living documents? Okay, well then let's listen to what else they will tell us. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a, it's a form that is an attempt to glean every, every bit of help from the world of language and the world of these, you know, these powerful sources um, as, as possible. We have a, that's great, that's a great answer. This, we have a question, I mean, particularly what you said about the, those founding documents, right? Uh, and transforming them, uh, just seeing just how, just how living they are, right? Um, question from G Garav, I apologize, I'm probably mispronouncing your name, G-A-U-R-A-V. -E. Uh, could one or both of you speak to how you see the role of poetry and artistic expression in making individual and collective Black freedom in the present moment? Mm -hmm. Come on for this question. <laughs> you gotta ask us something hard. Yes, God. <laughs> could one or both of you speak to how you see the role of poetry and artistic expression in making individual and collective Black freedom in the present moment? Do you have an answer for that, Tracy? Well, I am hungry for an answer to that question. And I think that when poems can act upon us in ways that outsmart cognition, they are doing something really important. When you feel it in your body and when it activates a sense of knowing or remembering um, that is otherwise dormant, when it aligns you with the sense that there are others present, you know, when I, I read your poems, Jericho, and sometimes we is everybody, I'm present in that space. Yeah. And um, that is real. And that is a form of power that is not imaginary. And that I believe is necessary for the kind of mobilization, you know, that that I think lives in your question or that your question is looking toward. I think that we have to awaken some something in our bodies, in our minds that alerts us to a, this uh, psychic, communal um, space that we inhabit. And it's not just us. It's not just we who are Black. This space is also inhabited by the very people that we believe um, are impeding liberation. And so how do we do something together? How do we create something that cannot be ignored and that captivates and activates these capacities in, in people who don't believe in them? That's my wish. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say, that's smart. I'll just say that I, I've always thought, you know, um, when a song comes on and you love the song, you literally say out of your mouth, this is my song. You didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> You're not singing. You didn't produce it. You didn't write it. You weren't at the studio that day. But that is your song, and I believe that about. Uh, I believe that about all art. I believe you know, this is my painting. This is my dance. You know, I'm not dancing, but the dance I am viewing. That's my dance. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that about poetry too. And I think uh, one way toward this is for us to uh, make more and better space. For, um, for understanding that there's something in art out there that is a need for us individually. Uh, if we can say that, then we've already done the collective work. Um, the other wonderful thing about that is that uh, that automatically makes us collective, right? If I believe there's something out there for me, then I have to believe there's something out there for everyone. Um, and what that, begins to do, if you think about that through a black lens, is that puts you in a position where you have to say, all black lives matter, <laughs> right? Uh, part, of, part of what we're talking about in this conversation and part of this question from, from Garab, I think has a lot to do with that all in the, in the black lives matter. Um, mm -hmm. And us, you know, part of what you're talking about when you talk about those trying, the impending, right? <laughs> Uh, part, of, part of that has to do with, uh, with an understanding, a complete and total understanding that we really need mm -hmm. all of us, 
um, not just some of us. And, and an understanding that we're often moving, and this is, this is something I've learned from poems. I mean, you have to allow poems. I don't think people realize these poems are actually changing our lives. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when I'm writing a poem, part of what I'm trying to do is say what I didn't expect to say. Mm-hmm. When you say what you didn't expect to say, you have to look at that thing and say, wait a minute, do I think that? And then after you figure out whether or not you really think that, that means if you say, yes, I think that, you have to start living like it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's what, I mean, that's what I'm doing. I don't know what anybody else is doing it right there, Paul. I know that's what you're doing. I know that's what I'm doing, but I don't know about these other people. So yeah. um, that kind of unity can only happen when we're interested in that. So it's, it's the poems are there. The question is, can we be there for the poem? Mm-hmm. The next question is from, from Mega. Or Me- oh, Mega, Meg, hey, um, <laughs> for Jericho. How did you decide on the three poetic forms to choose from while inventing the duplex? How did you decide to choose blues, puzzles, and sonnets for the duplex form? So um, this is a great question. The puzzles came just because it's so old and so um, so Persian, so <laughs> Middle Eastern, you know, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I, I felt very strong, and I love puzzles. I love the fact, um, you know, I love uh, a, a poem that's not a puzzle, but works in a way that we think puzzles work uh, in a station of the metro. I love to see juxtaposition mm-hmm. happening poems. I love to take two things that have nothing to do with each other and put them next to each other and and, and see the emotional reactions that that, mm-hmm. that that can create. And I wanted something that was so old and still yet so completely alive uh, in our poetry conversation, even in our contemporary poetry conversation. And obviously I wanted to sign it because I wanted something Western uh, because I feel like I'm descended from that, just like uh, I'm, I'm, dis- I'm uh, more obviously, I guess, descended from the blues. Um, I also wanted sonnets in particular because I believe every poet who writes um, has a love-hate relationship with the sonnet. Uh, they're all, uh, you know, if you're when you're talking to people who've never read a poem, if you say sonnet, they know you're talking about a poem. You know, whereas if you say pandemic, they didn't hear you. They think you mean pandemic these days. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, so, and I'm inter- I was interested in the way the sonnet is pervading, and the way over and over again we return to it, and or subvert it. And again, I'm thinking uh, a great deal about about going in the books. That poem in the book called Hero, I think of as a descendant of Gay Chaps at in the at the bar by by Gwendolyn Brooks. Uh, and then the blues just has to do with the fact that I am indeed um, a diva lover, like Langston Hughes was. You know, Langston Hughes loved Bessie Smith, and he loved mm-hmm. to hear a black woman holla while she sang. And uh, I'm I'm very much the same, and I'm definitely a descendant of Langston Hughes in my poetry. And I wanted that very American and obviously black American form to meet up with these other forms. So that's mm-hmm. how I made that choice. Thank you for asking that, Megan. Uh, there's a question from S- Sunita. Given the state of the country and the vulnerable aspects of poetry, what currently inspires you? What gives you hope? What currently inspires you, Tracy? What gives you hope? Hmm. <clears throat> well, I love the way that you describe being there for the poem, being, being out there. Seeing a poem, this is how I'm going to see what you said. A poem identifying something that that you know you belong to, mm-hmm. and so wanting to just throw yourself into that space and 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 you know be there for the poem, like you said, to to um, and also leap out of leap out of the habitual. Um, I see that in language, but I also see it in, you know, I see it in other art forms, but I also see it in being and 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 in living, um, and that sense of is it? It's partly courage. It's hugely uh, creativity, but it's about something that I want to think of as like belief, you know. 
the belief that I need to get up and and put on, you know, the yellow dress or like that I, I want to be in physical space as um, a version of myself that some people don't believe I should do, should, should inhabit. Like that when I witness, especially like younger people, um, my students um, living, I feel, I feel like I have to keep doing this and I want to keep doing this. And there's so much that is the opposite of that. <laughs> so much that fosters the opposite of that feeling. Um, so that that's inspiring to me. Um, mm -hmm. Reading poetry has long been inspiring to me, but but it's this this life force, you know, instances of of um, emphatic, um, beautiful, pure life force <laughs> um, that that make me believe that I, I'm the work I'm doing can help to um, I don't know to spread that around a little bit. Now, one of the questions that I didn't get to when we were in conversation before this set of questions had to do with um, uh, your relationship to the poet Adelia Prado. Hmm. You actually introduced me to, I didn't know her work before and then I fell in love with her too. And uh, I was gonna ask you about how she's, you know, how you see yourself as being inspired by, by her hmm. work and your use of color in your work, which I always think every time it comes up, I always think, oh, there's Adelia coming up in, hmm. in Tracy K. Smith's poem. So I'll just say, uh, to answer this question, I'll say um, Adelia Prada <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> gives me hope. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a question from Stacy. Tracy, is it more difficult to read these newer poems out loud? They're so personal and from such a deep place of pain. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, I don't think it feels difficult to read them, but they come out differently. I hear I hear them uh, expressed or even expressing themselves through me differently mm -hmm. than the poems that I've, um, you know, that I've been reading for longer or that are, um, allow me to have a different kind of distance between the, the sense of quandary or even conflict that the poem is exploring. Mm -hmm. um, but I also love how close to the bone these poems feel. Um, you, I mean, you've always been a very political poet. I mean, in every book, I think of the poems as, as direct, I mean, not indirectly <laughs> political, right? Especially a book like Life on Mars, you know what I mean? Um, but there is something very yes and no about these poems. And I think that's part of what, um, part of what Stacy is hearing, even when you were reading, I was like, oh my God, Tracy. <laughs> Cause it's, um, you know, it's very difficult, I think, to say right and wrong mm -hmm. in a poem, particularly when you're taught about poetry that uh, mm -hmm. things should be ambiguous or things should be gray area oriented, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet there are, Ilya and I talk about this, Ilya Kaminsky, a poet who lives here in Atlanta. Um, we talk about this all the time about um, the moral and ethical responsibility of poets to be honest in their work about rights and about wrongs, which uh, American poets, according to Ilya, will indeed shy away from. That mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that sense. I think it's like, is it decorum? I don't think it's, it's, it's about maintaining a sense of um, cool authority that we have, you know, the workshop, starts that education process because you've got to sit there and put your, you know, it's changing now. But when we came through, it was, you sit there, you put your poem out and you dispassionately allow it to be challenged and pushed and maybe praised, maybe not. Um, and you, you kind of take it. And it's this very masculine, um, I think probably a white, um, maybe it's rooted in class or an aspiration toward the sense of poise that we associate with a certain sense of class or belonging. But it also means that you're not going to go all the way mm -hmm. um, in so many of the, the moral um, ways that you're talking about. And I just, 
I don't buy it. And I guess I'm adamant about it because I also understand how I have been shaped and formed by that. And I'm teaching myself to say, okay, that's over. Um, that doesn't mean I don't value the moment in a poem where I do come to feel implicated in the problem. That's important to me. Um, but I also feel that maybe there are different ways of getting to that, that space of feeling caught in an assumption or in an allegiance you weren't aware that you had. And this, this new work, I hope will reveal a, a different sense of, all right, I think I'm right, but I still have to do, do better, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that you said feeling hot. It reminds me of um, Natasha Trethway who always says she knows she's writing because she starts sweating. Yes. <laughs> yes. The conditioner could be on 65, you know? <laughs> but she's like, she's like, oh, it's going down now because I'm like wiping sweat. Yeah. Um, can I just say this uh, on what you said? I also think, and I don't know, I don't know how to get at this exactly because I love the creative writing workshop. I do believe in craft, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think there's something about that that is just as systemic as some of these other things we're talking about. I mean, how convenient is it that the same people who wanted to do all kinds of evils would also say, it doesn't matter how evil the poet was. What matters is the poem. Do you understand what I mean? Like, I think it's, there is something, there's something going on with the ways in which we do shy away from that which is moral or shy away from that which is ethical, which I think has something, I do think it, there's, there's a systemic thing there where we put ourselves in a position such that we don't have to make a stand mm -hmm. and we don't have, and as long as we don't have to make a stand, mm -hmm. we don't have fix anything about ourselves or our lives or our families or our work situation or do you understand what I mean? And, yeah. and I mean, that's systems, not are, systems are great uh, because they create these boundaries in a way. And we can say, well, that's on the other side of this boundary. And um, you know, the, the the heart of this person and the hate in that heart is on the other side of these impeccable lines. And we're gonna just concern ourselves with these impeccable lines. You know, that's a, a poem is a system. And mm -hmm. of course there are these other systems as well. A university is a system. And um, when people like Woodrow Wilson are the representative of something that you wanna claim, um, I guess we've gotten to the point where we can understand that that's, that's problematic, mm -hmm. but you know, I guess it, it has a lot to do with what has been built, you know, in a poem, in a workshop, also in an institution, you know, there's an investment, a, an actual investment that has accrued great interest, um, but it, it's built atop, you know, crimes, it's built atop um, yeah. backward I, perspectives. Well, we should have another Unbound Festival where we talk about just this. Because this, uh, I think, for particularly for young writers, this is the biggest trouble. This is the biggest question, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and and to simplify that question, it's like, do I get to listen to R. Kelly or not? Do, <laughs> yeah. you, know, do you understand what I mean? And it, I mean yeah. It's a weird thing because, like, for yeah. instance, Tracy, you can't work, you can't do erasures of the Declaration of Independence if you haven't read the Declaration of Independence. But if you're not going to read the work of racists, you never read the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> you see what I mean? So that's the kind of thing that I think we really do have to, um, yeah. we need a longer time to really talk about these things. Cause I think a lot of people because of our current moment are really struggling with how to go about enjoying art mm -hmm. or how to go about being influenced or how to go about researching and learning a mm -hmm. past canon that we result from whether we like it or not. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Well, this is a, a, you're making me realize this is the site where some of that, that complicity exists. Mm -hmm. And the answer is not to say, well, these things have to now be moved off the table, but to say, um, 
I've inherited this, mm-hmm. you know, by choice and otherwise. And so I need to grapple with it because I'm inside here too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And somehow that seems to be like the inverse of a decision that some people have, you know, m- are, are made to feel they must make, which is, you know, you want to be embraced by, we'll just call it a system because that's what we've been calling it. You want to be part of this establishment. Um, we, you want to be authorized to write your poems and publish your poems, make them legible. You must let go of certain things that will will make them illegible to most people who are inside of this, you know. I feel like the the gates around that, there's Woodrow Wilson on one side, there's the, the declaration, you know, like there's the student who's being invited to come in um, and and let go of, of something that is questioned um, for whatever reason. Yeah, we, we need to get into that space and, and think about it. Um, and it's not easy, you know, because we're all in there. The fact of you know, being here where we are in our careers, um, we're in there, but we also have work to do upon that. Yeah, yeah. The next question is, I'm proud to be, this is a question, I'm proud to be a public school writing teacher here in Columbia. What advice do you have for us to inspire young people to be honest and sharing their unique perspectives you have an answer to that question, Tracy? What advice you have to inspire young people to be honest and sharing their unique perspectives on the Well, I think um, authorizing them that their perspectives can be rooted in what is real and urgent for them is a big first step. Um, and for me, that comes with reading work that that does that, you know, for me, feeling authorized to write about my family um, or the geography that I grew up in came from reading Seamus Heaney and realizing, oh, my God, he's talking about a big family and their connection to place and history. Um, and it's entirely different from what I know, but it's actually not that different from what I know. Mm-hmm. And so finding work that doesn't even have to be um, far flung that that invites students to to recognize what they have and how important it is that that seems like a big first step what would you say i would just say it's a good idea to tell people the truth and just because they're young doesn't mean you shouldn't tell them the truth i think we have a lot set up i mean i you know even in my i teach young adults but they're very young adults and i I often encounter the fact that they just haven't been told the truth about things, whether it's the country or how a family works or what it's like to actually love someone. <laughs> like they just, they don't, they don't know. And part of the reason why they don't know is because we're under the impression that we should be lying to children. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's got to be a way to say what we have to say without lying. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, part of, part of to, to get at that, um, you can't ask people to fully express if they're walking around thinking they're crazy. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid growing up, people were not telling me the truth, but they were showing me the truth. Hmm. And so I would think that I was losing my mind. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I, mean, hmm. I think this is the case for many uh, very young queer people. You're under. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, like, huh? And if somebody would have just if I would have just had some truth serum uh, more regularly, then I wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been weird. No one would have thought I was strange and I wouldn't have thought anyone else was strange, you know? Um, mm-hmm. There's a question from Lauren, Lauren Williams. What other poets and writers are inspiring you and comforting you right now with their work? Is there anyone in particular who has sustained you during this difficult year of pandemic and racial Mm. We, we've named some poets, so maybe this po- maybe this question came in uh, before. I mean, we've sort of named Clifton and, and Brooks and Adelia Prado, but um, mm. Claudia Rankin. But do you have others that you want to add to that? Oh yeah. Well, I've been teaching. You know, taught you over the last three semesters of the pandemic. Denez Smith, um, Sue Huang, um, 
evaluating. Mm-hmm. Um, these are some some people who give me a great sense of hope, consolation, trouble, good trouble. Um, so those are those are some. I always have a hard time coming up with a really good and full representative list of who I really love. Mm-hmm. But those are some of the people that have. Oh, John Murillo's new book. Yeah, um, it's good. It's good. Yeah, yeah. He just won the Kingsley Tufts. Big congrats to John. Oh, yay! He's He's good. Wonderful. He's a good book. Yeah, um, I called John just the other day. I said I need you to pray for me. Uh, John Mixon Webster, who's a great poet. That's another poet people could look up. Uh, was here for his birthday, which is the same week as my birthday. And uh, I said, John, you need to pray for us because we plan to party uh, in ways that could get us arrested. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here's a question from Beck. How do you, this is a good question. How do you decide which poems go in a collection? I know that I have a hard time ever feeling satisfied with pieces I've written. I can't even imagine trying to send a collection to be published, exclamation point. Mm-hmm. How do you decide, Tracy, which poems go in a collection? For me, they have to be talking to one another and they have to be having a conversation that I'm aware of. And then they must alert me to other conversations that I hadn't realized were going on between them. That's when I get excited and I think, oh, okay, there's something happening here. I'm now finally kind of like getting getting in on it a little bit more. How can I help to, to amplify that? And that makes it easy for me to know which poems that I might like don't actually belong in that book because they're they're talking in another direction. And so some of the choices that I've been grateful to have made over the years is just tabling some poems that might have been written with one book, but that aren't talking to the poems in that book. That's a great answer. There's a question. Um, Tracy writes, we took stock of we took stock of another. We wept to be reminded of such color. Can Tracy tell us how she handles balancing the grief around us as a tool in creativity without letting it take over? How do you balance the grief around us as a tool of creativity without letting it take over, Tracy? Well, often it's grief or unrest of one form or another that turns me to the to the poem, to writing. And then the poem, you know, like you were saying, you, I want it to be, I want to speak to this Persian form and I want to speak to this American form and I want to speak to this black form, thinking about the possibilities in terms of craft. Um, it temper, it doesn't temper, it adds another um, another line to that, that um, thought process or that, that internal conversation. And it can be deadly serious but all of a sudden it also becomes lilting and joyful and exhilarating um, because you're building, you're following, you're listening, you're, you're leaping. And um, for me, that creative work, which is invigorating, does something to help minister to the burden of, of difficult and heavy feelings. So one last question, I think we have two minutes left, so we'll answer this one quickly before they um, get the cane and pull us off. (laughs) Um, uh, This is from Alexis. During the past year, were there times when you witnessed a certain event and was immediately inspired to write? Or is your work mostly reflective and after the fact? To which I I think think answer definitely yes, my work is mostly reflective. (laughs) Uh I mean, I, I think I'm always just writing about childhood which was obviously mm-hmm. a very long time ago. What about you, Tracy? Well, I think it's both. And I think that it's often something that triggers an immediate desire to write a poem that sends me into a reflective process that I wasn't, you know, wasn't gambling on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, I, I like to allow both impulses to, to operate um, because I don't want to lose anything. Yeah. <laughs> after, um, I, I wrote bullet points very shortly after the death of Sandra Bland, mm-hmm. uh, because I knew that there were, I already knew that there were many people who had supposedly committed suicide under very strange circumstances while in police custody. And so when that death happened, I remember almost immediately, it's just my memory came to me in lines, do you know what I mean? And so I could work on 
of what became that poem. Uh, but I think we're out of time. This has been wonderful. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. Really, what a gift. I'm really glad. Hi, Alex. Hi. 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 That was amazing. I cannot think of a more perfect way to wrap up the last three months of conversations. Thank you. Thank you. That was just, just wonderful. I'm going to take away something you said quite early on, Tracy. You said, poetry does what it always does. You have a problem and I'm here to help you. And I just thought that was so, so perfect. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you again to the Creative Writing Program uh, of the MU uh, uh, English Department for their sponsorship of this keynote event. Um, and then something I know that people are going to be excited to know, we have two winners. Um, I'm not sure that we actually got to either of your questions. So perhaps this is some kind of consolation for you. Martina McGowan and Pamela Ross. Um, so if you would please email us at mail at unboundbookfestival.com uh, and we will get uh, copies uh, of Tracy's book and Jericho's book to you. Yay. Finally, I just want to thank you again, Tracy and Jericho, for an absolutely enchanting evening. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And we will see you in person on Thursday, April the 21st, to Sunday, April the 24th, 2022. Thanks you very much indeed. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Tracy. Good night. Thank you, Jericho. Thank you, Alex.